I brought my toothbrush for you. A uh, little story behind it. I bought it about six months ago, and I've been using it. And about two weeks ago, this is here at the church, and I have a little bathroom, and I was, I was just trying to knock the water off it, and all of a sudden, something happened. And I put it in my mouth again. I'm like, what's going on? It's like my phone going off or what? And then I realized this is a Oral-B Pulsar and it has a little button with a positive and a negative. And if you hit the button, it's like an electric toothbrush. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I didn't even know that. And so it comes with a battery. And I looked on the thing and I didn't even know. I thought, why was it, you know, a little bit more expensive? But I can't believe I used it for six months and didn't even realize I could have that power. <laughs> yeah, man. So uh, it made me think this morning as I was leaving my office, made me think that that's a lot like us as Christians. We don't realize there's a battery included in our Christian life. We don't realize we have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us to do all this stuff. And so we may go a long time without even enjoying the benefit of that. And it, it's, uh, it's something we started last week to talk about, the, the uh, irresistible fruit, we're calling it, this new series that will take us through to Christmas. Um, we talked a lot last week about the Holy Spirit. We talked about walking in the Spirit. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit and kind of set the context for today to begin looking at different aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, starting today with love, the first one, love. I don't put a lot of credence in the order in the Bible for the nine, but love being first is definitely important because love is the greatest fruit, the greatest aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. That's clear from the rest of Scripture. It is the greatest quality, the greatest word that uh, is used to describe God. So let's talk about love today. Let's talk about love. It's an awesome uh, thing. Um, I want to say first its importance and definition. And some of these are thoughts I've had for years, things that I've carried with me for <clears throat> since college. Um, but I want to give them to you, and then I'll give you more in the next point, what's been fresh on my heart this last week that I feel to say to you from God about his love. Uh, but first, let's talk about the importance and the definition of love. Um, Matthew 22, verse 36 through 40, Jesus said, he said that the way that you could summarize the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, was with two commands, and both of them have the word love in it. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So we see if, if love could summarize the whole Old Testament, it must be pretty important. We come into the New Testament and we see in Colossians 3 verse 14, the Apostle Paul says, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Okay, so there's Paul saying beyond all these other qualities, and he, he mentioned patience and compassion and kindness and gentleness and, and, and humility. And then he said, but beyond all of this, put on love, because that's the perfect bond of unity. And we have someone contributing. Yay! <laughs> So then we go to the Apostle Peter, and we hear his view of the importance of love. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. So again, the, the superlative above all. Keep fervent in your love, because this will somehow help you with your sin. It'll overcome your sin. Now, that relates to our context this morning, because we're displacing the sin nature, the tendency, the strong tendency to sin inside of us with not just the Holy Spirit, but with the Holy Spirit, the first fruit of which is love. So somehow we're going to love something else than our sin. And it's not just about a greater power, it's about a greater love. And so we love our sin. Those are idols, and the only way out is to love something else or to be loved. And that's why the first fruit of the Spirit that overcomes the works of the flesh is love. Love is the crucial, most important issue. Love, love, love. First Corinthians 13, Paul says we can have all the qualities of communication and knowledge and faith and spirituality and generosity and sacrifice, but if you don't have love, you're nothing and you profit nothing. And so enough about the importance of God's love. I hope you see, it's not me making it up. It's not me just getting all excited today about whatever today is. This is truly significant, truly important in even among the fruit of the Spirit. It's the, the diamond. It's the first one for good reason. Well, what is it? 
What is love? We turn to our society first. I remember a bumper sticker I saw in a convenience store one day, and I wanted to get it for my car, but I know y'all wouldn't understand, so I didn't. But it said, I love you, I adore you. What's your name again? And it's the idea, of course, of I'm attracted to you. I have no idea who you really are, but I'm attracted to you physically. And in our society, that's huge for what love means. It emphasizes especially romantic feelings and sexual attraction. Uh, it's mutual and escalating. I love you, or, or the first person starts, I like you, I like you, I like you a lot, I like you a lot, I love you, what? <laughs> And there's that, there's as long as we're building and growing and escalating, we will call that love. But as soon as there's some dip or some circumstance that hurts our relationship, like that, then you'll often hear the line, we don't love each other anymore. Like a, it sounds like a funeral. It's like it's over. There's no fixing it. And often that can be the death of a relationship that needs a resurrection. It can be the death of a marriage covenant through an affair. Um, but it's not love. And we shouldn't confuse it with love. I don't love you anymore. That's uh, society understanding of love. So now, what about the true definition? What is God's love as his spirit indwells us? What should we expect that to be like receiving and giving it in the power of God's Holy Spirit? And we come up with quite a different definition. One that I've liked from my... <laughs> That's all right. We're getting it. Blessed are those that mourn, <laughs> for they shall be comforted. <laughs> um, so let's see. When we come to the true definition of love, it's a decision to be primarily concerned with the welfare of another person, regardless of their condition or reaction. I got this from Stuart Briscoe from Elmbrook Church in Milwaukee, a uh, British pastor, preacher, uh, clear back in, when I was in college. And it's been a good working definition for me, at least brings out one aspect of God, or uh, several aspects of God's love, a decision to be primarily concerned with the welfare of another person, regardless of their condition condition or their reaction. Okay, so it's not just a feeling. It's more than that. It's a choice. It's a decision. And it's not about me. I'm being primarily concerned about another person. And it's regardless of what they're like. And it's regardless of what they do in response. Whatever I get back. I hope for that. I'm attracted to the condition. I hope for the reaction. But it doesn't depend on that. It's a love that's based on the lover, not the love object. And this is important because we all need love the most when we deserve it the least. Okay, so real love needs to be there for people when they aren't lovely. You wanna love in a marriage, you have to love a sinner. You wanna love children, you have to be able to love them when they're not lovely. It has to be a love that comes from the lover and is not dependent on the love objects. It's a decision, it's a choice, not just a feeling, uh, although it includes definitely a feeling. Okay, so that's one definition. Another one that's really helped me, and this is one I've gotten myself over the years, is it's, a, it's, it's something you see in the arm. Now I wanna show you, no, I'm just kidding. But something you see in the arm, something you see in the eyes. Okay, so when you're thinking about God and you're imagining him with human, uh, characteristics and anthropomorphism, you can imagine the arm of God and then the eyes which reveal the heart of God. And so for me, that helps me to understand God's love because it's a strength, but it's also an affection. It's a, it's a capacity. And at the same time, it, it's, it's, it's a, 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 compa a compassion, a depth of empathy that, that we go into his heart as well. And it's balanced both together. It's a strength to, to give what is, is helpful and to hold back what's harmful. And, and it's a muscle. It's a great strength. I, I want to bless you, and I don't want to hurt you. So I'm holding back the harmful, and I'm offering the helpful. And I have a tremendous capacity to do that. That's from God. God does that. Jesus, when he was on the cross, handed us forgiveness, held back judgment. And there was a look at the strength of that man hanging on the cross to give us forgiveness and hold back judgment. And that's important because that will be in you. Through the power of the Spirit, you will have that strength when it comes to the people you're loving to help and not to hurt. A tremendous strength. But then beyond that, it's an affection. 
And we get this from God in the scripture. It's more than just a choice. When God loves us or says he loves us, we go into his heart. We are his children in Romans 8. We are the apple of his eye. One particular passage I like to read on this, because it's not emphasized that much. When God's people were Israel in the Old Testament and they were rebelling, and you know, for hundreds of years, God was patient. Then he judged them. He had other nations come and conquer them. They felt like they were forgotten by God. And we read in Isaiah 49, verse 14, and this is Jerusalem or Zion. Uh, but Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. And here's a tremendous window into the affectionate love of God as he responds to this in verse 15. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child that she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you, God says. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. And so God loves us, that's strong love, but it's also affectionate love. We are dear to him. We, we, Jesus cried when he looked at Jerusalem and wanted to, <clears throat> as a mother hen would gather her chicks, but they would not. And he cried looking over Jerusalem. He cried many times, many places for those he loved. For Mary, when she lost her brother Lazarus, Jesus wept. And when he did, he was even going to raise Lazarus, but he was so sensitive to her, loved her so much. When he saw her grieving, she went into his heart. He began to cry. That's God in the flesh. God, not just strong love, affectionate, affectionate love. That's important because that's going to come through us. It's not just a strength. It's also an affection. And when we have it, people we don't even like will be dear to us. We'll be like, I really like you. You're, you're, I have affection for you, which makes it so much easier for me to relate to as a Christian brother. Uh, or as a Christian sister. And so a little bit on the definition, it's a strength and an affection. Well, now let me get to the part that I feel I can be a prophet today to me and to you and to all of us, because um, it's not just the importance and the definition of love. It's the greatness, the greatness of God's love. And I hope I don't offend you when I say this. So I'm speaking to myself but you don't know what God's love is. And I don't know what God's love is. And I gotta tell you that. It'll end up being good news, but hear me. If you don't hear other things, if it's hard to follow me, hear this. You don't know the love of God. You don't know what it is. I could give you a nice little definition. I could stand up and talk for 10 minutes about it, and you might be able. If you're in the category of you think love is like our culture, you don't know the God. If you're a Christian and you have a nice definition that you can say that distinguishes it from our culture, and you can say God's love is blah, 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 but that statement that you've made for years doesn't have much of an effect on your life, then I'll just say you don't know the love of God. And the good news is it's still wonderful, and you're just not realizing it. Something that simple. God's love is so great, it can only be imagined. It can't be known. It surpasses knowledge. And of course, we get this from Ephesians 3. This is a prayer that'll put your prayer life back on the map. You hear this prayer. I've heard it this week. I want to pray it every morning. I want to guess like one of those prayers. I got to say this every morning just to build something, just to hope for something that I desperately want in time. God, I will say this prayer every morning. And it's the prayer in Ephesians 3, uh, verses 17 through 19. Paul says of the Ephesians, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know his love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now I'll just say if that's happening for you then your concept of God's love will be getting bigger and brighter Every day that you pray that God answers that prayer, not a static thing. Well, when I ask that, ching, ching, here's what I say. And it really doesn't have that much, it hasn't had a much great, no, no, this is something you can't know. You can only begin to imagine and then experience and it completely changes you. So I'm just saying, God's love is so great. You can't know it. You can only begin to imagine as an answer to prayer experience. And when you do, it will change you. It's the best thing in the Bible. It's the best thing in the world that God loves you and me. And don't pass that over with some little 
set of words and think you know it and you can move on because it's not that great. Go back and begin to imagine and pray that God helps you know the love of God. This is such a powerful point that God's impressed on me. You'll know that, you, that, that you'll begin to know or realize or grasp the dimensions of God's love when it makes you smile, <laughs> when it makes you laugh, like belly laugh. You know your love. That's what the world's starving for. We're all starving for. We've all got these empty tanks and no one can love us well enough. And then you realize God loves you on that level. You just want to laugh out loud. If you know it, it'll make you happy. You'll know it because you're laughing and you're full and, and none of your other idols can deliver. And now finally, your God loves you and it's enough. You'll know you, that you're beginning to grasp or understand the imagine, experience the love of God when you want to love him back, when you're attracted to God, when God is like there all day and you just can't wait to get back to him because you're not getting back to somebody who's making you feel guilty or somebody who's disappointed with you or somebody who who's just keeps bringing up the stuff that you're failing about. No, you're getting back to the God who just really loves you. And when you know that somebody loves you, you want to be around them. And so you just drift back and come back to God all the time. Well, then if that's true for you, you're wanting to love him back all the time, now you're starting to know it. But if not, don't give me the definition, blah, 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 and it's not having any effect on you. You don't know it yet. And the good news is you could know it, and it could be amazing. We know what God's love is when it's stronger than all pleasure in our life, when it makes our accomplishments seem like nothing or irrelevant. When it takes our mind off anything else and we're like, wow, this is the most wonderful thing. Right here is home. Right, right here is home. God loves me. I'm okay forever. And I don't care about nothing else. Now you're starting to get it. Not just a simple little definition, head knowledge. Knowing it, experiencing it, grasping its dimensions. It's so great. You'll see the effect. We know what God's love is when it's greater than all human love, even the strongest crush, the wildest romance, the deepest companionship we've ever experienced. God's love is far better. Don't put it in a different category and, and, and then not expect it to have a, an effect. It's greater and it's real. It's supernatural. So it should have a stronger effect on us than any other human love that we've experienced. And if so, we're beginning to know it. If not, we don't know what it is. We're a Christian and we don't know what God's love is. So it's going to be really hard for us to do the Christian life. That's our problem. Come back, pray this prayer. Paul was praying it's the most important thing. Above all, fulfill the whole law in the Old Testament. How are you going to love it if you don't have it? How are you going to express it if you haven't experienced it? Come back. God's love when it was known in the Bible completely changed grown men, causing them to go out of their minds and eventually become martyrs. It's another sign of knowing God's love. It brings the capacity to sacrifice that you've never had. We have this for our children. We say that, and, we, and it's true. How much more the love that we could have or God has for us would give us the ability to sacrifice, would increase our giving capacity. And this is another sign that we know it. It's another reason we should pray it. It's the first way the Holy Spirit looks when he shines through and flows through us and overcomes the power of sin. It's love, 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 the greatest thing in the world. And if you begin to taste even to know it, you'll have the ability to sacrifice like you've never had. Your giving capacity will increase. Do you know what love is? What has it done for you? How has it changed you? The love of God, it's wonderful. Often our life experiences give us the leaps forward that we need and the experience of God's love. And that happened for me the first time uh, that I fell in love. I was in 10th grade on my way back from a conference with our youth group. And we stopped to eat at a McDonald's. And I sat down. I, I remember, I don't remember very much about this moment, except that I was starving. And I was sitting in front of a super-sized Big Mac meal that I had just bought and was ready to consume. 
And just as I was about to dive in, a girl sitting across from me named Kathy Cottle pointed to her best friend, Jenny Cage, who was sitting over at the other table at the moment, bowing her head, saying grace with some other girls. So her eyes were closed. And she said to me, she said, she likes you. <laughs> now, Jenny... That somebody like me is a wonder in itself, but that she, that Jenny Cage, best looking girl by far in the youth group, best girl, best looking girl in the conference that we were at, way, way out of my league, way out of my league. And so when she said that to me, I immediately lost my appetite, wasting some high quality food that was sitting in front of me. <laughs> Really? I had her affection. She was thinking about me all the time. Jenny, she wanted to be close to me. Whoa, I'm a 15 year old boy, whoa, are you serious? Oh my gosh. It was easily the highlight of my life to that, that point. Our relationship lasted seven months into my early months of my junior year in high school and ended like many do at that age. And I went on to meet Lynn in college, a much more wonderful woman for me. And uh, God, uh, but when I look back, I'll never forget the power of that, ex that initial uh, love uh, experience. I didn't care when, when, I, when that happened to me, I, I remember sitting in class just, just glowing. <laughs> Happy. In fact, my teachers, my coaches, they're like, and I just looked at them and I said, I'm in love. <laughs> and they, and they, they, I just remember the smile. <laughs> yeah, we've seen that look before. That's hilarious. <laughs> that is so funny. Never forget it. I didn't care about my grades. I didn't even care about sports, which was my whole thing. I didn't care about my popularity, my friends, my reputation or anything in comparison. And so we say, well, that's puppy love. That's infatuation, very powerful, but temporary. How does that compare to God's love, which is much higher, much more dignified? Isn't God's love something different? Serious dedication, obedience, sacrifice, all these other words that don't attract me as much and don't have much impact on my life? And I say, man, God's love is stronger and better than any love we experience here on earth as God's creatures made in his image. It's gotta be better. Different, of course, but stronger, better, should have an even greater effect on us. Another experience that's helped me, and it's one that's very typical, you hear from a lot of folks about understanding finally, they'll say, I finally under begin to understand God's love. And you're like, wow, you've been a Christian for years and you're admitting you didn't know God's love and it was there all the time, day and night, and you didn't enjoy it, you didn't respond back to it, you missed it because you didn't know it. But then you finally had your child and you would admit, I finally get how God loves me, really. And that happened to me. Had my first child, my daughter Joy. First time I held her in my arms, I couldn't believe she was mine. My baby daughter changed me. I went out a couple days later and I did 19 full service visits as a pool cleaner. Went to 19 different places starting at dawn till dusk and never worked harder in my life. My GPA at seminary went up even though I was much busier and had a lot more to do. I was changing. I had a whole new nightmare now, and it was her little sweet hand slipping out of mine and her disappearing under dark water in the ocean. And uh, that's where I grew up in Virginia Beach, Norfolk, and I just always had that nightmare over and over, which showed I had a brand new love. And it was so strong that there was the accompanying fear and even the nightmare behind it. And you can see real change even in my dreams, this love for this little blob of protoplasm. I remember going up the outside stairs to our second floor apartment when we first brought her home from the hospital and she was in a little infant seat and I was walking up those skinny stairs to our apartment. I'm thinking, what if I drop this? I was 24, I'd never had that kind of responsibility. A little life, a little person, a little beautiful little thing depending completely on me. It created a soft spot that's still there today. And my other two children came along and created that soft spot even more and I'm still 
uh, I just still melt over all three of them. I love to hear from them when they call. I love to give to them. I love to do whatever I can do to help them have a great life. Their success, their joy is double my success, double my joy. I immediately am on the solution page whenever they're struggling. I don't fault them. I don't quibble. I just immediately am trying to help. And then I think, can I outlove God? Is his love for me less than my love for my kids that he's given me because he loves me so much? And I realize he really loves me more than I love my kids. <laughs> Blows my mind. Begin to imagine it, begin to grasp it. This thing that's been there, but I didn't know, I didn't enjoy it, I didn't experience it, I missed it because I didn't know it was there, near, deeper in me than my sin. Ready to love, ready to minister to me on heaven's level in a way that would be beyond any of my human love relationships. This is terrific news. God's love is far more wonderful than our understanding of it that's had such a small effect on our life. Is it true that God is always thinking about us, even though he's even more wonderful than every person we've ever met? Is it true that God wants to be close to us and bless us and that his nearness is on heaven's level what it is like? Could that be true? Could that take your appetite away? Could that make you forget your own accomplishments, your reputation, what other people say, your other loves? Could it displace that? Could it just bowl all those other loves over? Could it be true that he's strongly affected by our ups and downs, our success and failure? Is it really true that God loves me and you? Well, we'll never come to the end of it. You know, you, you meet a person and you're in a beginning relationship and then you always come to the point where you get to the end. You're like, oh, I'm so excited about you and now I see the limits. Okay. There's never a person that just continues in years of time to keep us just amazed with curiosity and anticipation, except for God. For God, we never get out of the initial phase of wonder and anticipation because we never get to the end. It's always more, it's always bigger and brighter, more wonderful than we could imagine, more greater than we think. Right here, uh, every Sunday, we're very aware of the danger of familiarity when it comes to God's love. We do communion every Sunday, which means we talk about the love of God in Christ as he hung on the cross, and we remember that, and we receive that into our, into our, our being and respond. And we talk about love in our worship songs. It's, it's probably the greatest attribute that's featured, and that's the way it should be. And it's often in our sermons and other ways. Then there's, it's always there with the gospel. It's the theme of the gospel. Wherever, whatever time we go over how you become a Christian, it's right there. And that's as it should be because people who really love each other, who have a great relationship, frequently express their love in a joyful manner. And that's great. But we don't want it to get old. We don't want it to lose its impact that we do communion every Sunday, that we talk about God's love over and over and over, and it doesn't have impact. And so I just want to say this. I believe every time it comes up, we can go farther. Not keeping it fresh, not keeping it meaningful. No. We've only begun to scratch the surface. So every time it comes up, may it be a challenge to go farther up and farther in. Not to be familiar, not to have no impact because it loses impact, but every time we say, Lord, make it bigger, make it brighter, till I'm more able to sacrifice, till I'm released from my other loves, till I acknowledge that you are loving me better than I've ever been loved in my life or than I've ever realized your love in my life. And so I pray that God will give it that effect. Pray Ephesians 3, verse 17 through 19, that we would all begin to grasp the dimensions every Sunday more, more, more than we've ever done. And I'll go first in saying, I don't know what it is. And so bring it up again. Say it again. Do another communion. Every time I pray on this time, it'll warm my heart. On this time, it'll fill my tank. On this time, it'll take my other appetites away because it's so real, so strong, so wonderful. I want us to move beyond uh, 
the phrase, I am blessed. Okay, I like, obviously, the idea of blessing. It's overused. People use it in our culture. They'll talk about being blessed like the gods favor me too and you. And all of this is, is like I'm blessed can be such a general term. But even for us as Christians, we go further than just I'm thankful. Oh, look at all these things that I have in my life. I'm so thankful. I'm so fortunate. I'm so blessed. Go beyond that and say, I'm so loved. Because then there's someone behind the blessing who's trying to love you and has just given you things, given you things. Why do you think I'm giving you all these things? So you could say, oh, I'm so fortunate, I'm so blessed. No, so that you'll connect with me, God, the creator, the majestic one. I love you so much, I am blessing you, I am giving. So don't say I'm blessed, say, go, or go beyond and say I am, I'm loved and get to the person behind it and love him back. It's better than the blessings. They're all expressions of the love of God. It's just far more wonderful than any of the blessings or all of them together. What a great example of the first way that we're filled with the Spirit and we are, we are able to replace sin in our life. Love for me has been the best part of my life. My wife and I, Lynn, that's the sweetest spot, sweetest part of my life is the love we have and have had. It'll be 35 years this June. Uh, the love of our children, love of our grandchildren, um, the love of my siblings, my parents, when they were here before they went to heaven, I know they're up there still loving, still praying. Um, the love that I have for brothers and sisters in Christ, it doesn't get any better. And I'm telling the Lord, this is home for me. I want to stop. stay right here, Lord. I don't want to be, you know, admired. I want to be loved. I don't want to be famous. I just want to, I want to know your love and I want to give your love to these folks. This is the sweet spot. The first aspect of the fruit of your spirit. I want to stay right here. This is home for me. Home right here. And then God looks and he says, oh, that's why I, that's why I gave you my spirit, Dean. You're like, I'm going to make you and every person feel with my spirit like a superhero. And when you say, oh, what's your capability? What, I mean, what's your power? Receiving and giving love. What? No. On heaven's level, I can be loved and I can love you. God loves me and then he helps me love you. And that makes me a superhero, spirit-filled Christian. I can love with God's love. I can... Be loved by God's love. I can be better than that. And that's what I need. I gotta stop loving all these sins and start loving God and loving others. This is all part of the first fruit, the first aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. Well, let me go ahead and give you our communion intro now, and then we'll just pray when it's time for communion. Um, there's one giant hurdle, and that is we don't deserve it. And we're so used to performance-based love that when we have a bad day, we think God doesn't love this, doesn't remain true. And I'll just point you to the cross, the greatest statement ever, that Jesus loves sinners. While we were unable to lift a finger to deserve it, God loved us the best in giving us his son, and Jesus sacrificed himself to take on our sin and shame. And what could we say to the cross? It's God loving us, saying, I know you're sinful. I know your sin more than you do, and I'm paying the price for it right now. I love you anyway, and so I'm making it possible for you to still receive my love and love me back and love others with my love. So here, every time you remember me, it's my greatest act of love, and you never deserved it. So today, if you don't, I still love you. I love you when you're at your worst. I love you today if it's a bad day. My love is based on me, God says, not on you. Look at the cross. You can't deny it. God is loving you the best when you're at your worst. And that's when we all need it the most. And so we receive it. And we remember that. And I pray today that as communion comes around, it would be that for you. God just saying, I, I know how, how you good things, bad things, you'll always be getting better and needing forgiveness. But right now, just stop. I love you right now. Nothing you can do can make me love you any more or less. Right now, would you enjoy that? Right now, would you be changed by that? Stop the press. I love you, God says. As you take communion, remember that. It's there as a constant reminder. May we go further up and further in, and may the love of God be bigger and brighter than it's ever been, ever in our life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. We can worship you now, and we just want it to be that. Even our songs, may they be loving you back. 
May they be an experience of your love and reflecting it back. Lord, we can't give it if we don't have it. We can't express it if we haven't experienced it. So we pray with Paul that we might know the height, the depth, the width, the breadth of your love and begin to experience it and be changed by it. Lord, um, we don't want to miss knowing you. We don't want to miss a love that near, that, that strong, that powerful. So bless us as we sing and as we remember Jesus, his body, his blood. Uh, may it be uh, a true experience of the power of your spirit flowing through us. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.